This lecture will go over chapter 41, Infectious Diseases. Um, we've got some of the diseases you know need, that are listed on this slide, but there's more at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so just in general, to talk about communicable diseases. So communicable diseases are diseases that can spread easily from person to person. The incidence has declined with an increase of immunizations and also complications have decreased because of the use of antibiotics and antitoxins. It's important to assess recent exposure to infectious agents, prodromal symptoms, prodromal meaning the symptoms that you'd see at the start of infection, immunization history are the immunizations up to date and then if there's any history of having the disease primary prevention would be considered immunization and then there'd also we also would be considering controlling the spread of any disease by reducing the risk of cross transmission of organisms infection control policies and also hand washing Certain groups of children are at risk for serious complications from these infectious diseases. They include those who are receiving steroids or immunosuppressive therapy, those with generalized malignancies, those with immunologic or hemolytic diseases or disorders, and infants younger than one year of age. So we're going to start talking about specific diseases. We're actually going to start with rubiola or measles because that's where your textbook starts so we're going to hit them in the order that they occur in the textbook so on page 905 we your textbook talks about rubiola also known as measles rubiola or measles is caused by a virus the respiratory symptoms appear after an average of 10 days typically children have prodrome have a prodrome period Prodrome, meaning those early symptoms indicating the onset of a disease. So typically children have a prodrome period with fever that rises gradually and the three C's. So the three C's being coryza, which is a profuse runny nose, sort of appears like the, a common cold, cough, and the third C being conjunctivitis. And that lasts, the three C's usually last between two to four days. Children's are most, children are most contagious during this time and are usually quite copelic spots appear approximately one to four days before the appearance of the rash. Copelic spots are small blue-white spots with a red base that cluster near molars on the buccal mucosa. These spots increase in number before disappearing at approximately three days after which they slough off. As prodromal symptoms reach a peak, the exanthem or rash appears and is characterized by a deep red macular rash that usually begins on the face and neck and spreads down the trunk and extremities to the feet. The rash blanches easily with pressure and will gradually turn a brownish color. The duration of the rash is approximately six to seven days. Because of respiratory involvement, secondary infections such as otitis media, bronchopneumonia, and laryngotracheobronchitis or croup can occur, especially in infants and younger ch children, as well as cardiac manifestations such as myocarditis and peri pericarditis. Rarely central nervous system complications such as encephalitis develop during the prodromal period and can lead to long-term problems such as brain death. The most common cause of death from measles is pneumonia. For treatment, the treatment of measles is symptomatic, whether uh, the child is hospitalized or remains home. If hospitalized, the child will require airborne isolation precautions. Primary prevention for measles occurs through vaccination, through the MMR vaccinations. One of those um, M stands for measles. Children require two doses of the MMR vaccination for full protection. The first MMR vaccination is recommended routinely at one year of age. The second dose of MMR is recommended at four to six years of age. The second disease we're gonna talk about is rubiella, also known as German measles. It, um, just like measles or rubiola, is caused by a virus. Rubella is usually a mild disease in children and adults. The virus enters the host producing a rash at approximately 14 to 21 days. Young children are often asymptomatic until the appearance of a rash. Older children may report profuse nasal drainage, diarrhea, malaise, 
sore throat, headache, low-grade fever, polyarthritis, eye pain, aches and chills, anorexia, and nausea. The rash manifests as, as a pinkish rose maculopalpular exanthem, a rash, that begins on the face, scalp, and neck and is of, often puritic. It spreads downward to include the entire body within one to three days. So again, the pinkish rose maculopalpular exanthem, or rash, begins on the face, scalp, neck, is itchy, and spreads downward to include the entire body within one to three days. As the rash spreads to the trunk, the rash on the face, face begins to fade. Petechia, which are red or purple in color and pinpoint in size, may occur on the soft palate. Rubiella has relatively few complications. The most common are arthritis and arthralgia. A rare complication is encephalitis. The most devastating form of rubiella is congenital rubiella syndrome that occurs after maternal infection, usually during the first 12 weeks of pregnancies. One of the most common manifestations of congenital rubi rubella syndrome is intrauterine growth retardation. The infant is usually born at low birth weight and continues to have failure to thrive in infancy. Mortality is highest during the first year. For therapeutic management, treatment is generally supportive and symptomatic, with the disease being self-limiting with resolution within five days. Recommendation for exclusion of affected children from school or child care is seven days after the rash begins. Primary prevention for rubiella occurs through the MMR vaccination. The R in the MMR vaccination is for rubella. And again, that's a two-dose vaccination. The first dose at age one and the second dose recommended for ages four to six years of age. And the MMR vaccination, don't believe I talked about for measles, is a live vaccination. So something worth noting. The next viral infection we're going to talk about is erythema infectiosum, also known as fifth disease. Fifth disease is a relatively mild systemic disease. Typically appears, typically the child appears well, but has an intense fiery red edematous rash on the cheeks, which gives a slap cheek appearance. The rash often comes and goes. Before the appearance of the rash, many children are asymptomatic or have nonspecific symptoms such as headache, runny nose, malaise, and mild fever. Approximately one to four days after the facial rash appears, an erythematous maculopapular rash appears on the trunk and extremities. The rash fades with the central clearing area residing in a lacy appearance that you see with the rash, the rash on the right side of this slide. The rash lasts two to 39 days and can reappear when aggravated by environmental factors such as heat, exercise, warm baths, rubbing of the skin, and stress. Patients with sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia are at risk for anemia or an aplastic crisis. Patients with a poor immune system are also at risk for anemia. Under therapeutic management, the disease is usually benign and self-limiting. Treatment is symptomatic and supportive. The next disease is roseola infantum, also known as exanthem subitum. Um, it's caused by the virus human herpes virus 6. Most clinical cases of roseola occur in children 6 to 18 months of age. The child has a sudden high fever, 103 to 106, malaise and irritability, but may remain, but may remain active and alert. An intermittent or constant fever may persist for 3 to 5 days. The child may also have mild cough, runny nose, abdominal pain, headache, vomiting, and diarrhea. After three to five days, the fever subsides, and within several hours to two days, the rash a rash appears. The rash consists of rose pink maculopapules or macules that blanch with pressure. The rash occurs predominantly on the neck and trunk and may be surrounded by a whitish ring. It is normally persistent for 24 to 48 hours before fading. Complications associated with roseola are uncommon, but febrile seizures can occur. Treatment is symptomatic. Family members should be taught about fever control and management. Antipyretic medications, lightweight clothing, cooler environmental temperatures, and increased fluid intake all assist with fever control. 
we want to make sure we're teaching caregivers to avoid aspirin um, because of the potential risk for developing Ray's syndrome. The next viral infection we're going to talk about is varicella zoster infections, um, also known as chink chicken pox or shingles. We are going to focus on the primary infection, which, which is chicken pox. So the primary infection with the varicella zoster virus causes chicken pox. Just a side note, zoster or shingles, which is the reactivation of the latent varicella zoster virus, occurs most frequently in the elderly population, but can occur in children as well, especially adolescents and young adults. So a reactivation of that virus in the body can lead to shingles, but again, we're going to focus on chicken pox. Um, so manifestations. During the first 24 to 48 hours before the appearance of lesions, symptoms may include a slightly elevated body temperature, malaise, headache, and anorexia. A rash generally first appears on the trunk and scalp, followed by the appearance of lesions, which quickly become teardrop vesicles with, erythematous, with an erythematous base. The, ves the vesicles then become pustular, after which they begin to dry and develop crust. The lesions can appear on the mucous membranes in the mouth, genital area, and rectum. Under complications, the most common complication of the varicella zoster virus infection is secondary bacterial infection of the skin lesions. CNS complications um, can include encephalitis. The prognosis is generally positive unless CNS involvement is severe usually manifested by convulsions and coma. Parents should be given educational information regarding the absolute avoidance of any form of aspirin because of the potential risk for developing Ray's syndrome. Under treatment management or therapeutic management, treatment is symptomatic and supportive for the healthy child. Frequent bathing in an oatmeal bath and the use of antihistamines can relieve itching and prevent secondary bacteria, secondary bacterial infections. Acetaminophen to control fever is the best option. Again, we avoid aspirin because of the, the possibility of Ray's syndrome. Although acyclovir, acyclovir is not routinely recommended for healthy children with varicella, it can be considered for the use in severe cases, those with chronic illnesses, and those receiving long-term aspir aspirin therapy in children on short-term corticosteroid treatment. Immunocompromised children can receive acyclovir um, IV. The hospitalized patient with chickenpox should receive a private room with strict airborne isolation precautions. The CDC re recommends the varicella vaccine can be given to healthy non-immune children um, one year of age or older immediately after exposure or before three to five days in some cases. Primary prevention of varicella includes screening and administration of the vaccine at routine well-child visits. And just like the MMR vaccination, varicella vaccine is recommended at any visit on or after the first birthday for a healthy susceptible child, and a booster dose is given between four to six years of age. Under nursing considerations, the nurse needs to educate parents of children with varicella about skin care to prevent secondary bacterial infections and emphasize the importance of absolute avoidance of any forms of aspirin. In the hospital setting, all contaminated materials must be bagged and labeled before reprocessing. Hands should be washed after contact with the child and before contact with another patient. Hospitalized children who have been exposed to varicella should be kept in strict isolation for 8 to 21 days after the onset of the rash and the infected individual. At birth, neonates whose mothers have an active varicella infection should be placed in strict isolation. In addition, airborne precautions and contact precautions should be in effect for children with the herpes zoster infection. You have a yellow box about varicella in the immunocompromised child. Immunocompromised children um, with contract varicella may have large hemorrhagic lesions. Pneumonia is a frequent complication. Some children with acute form of varicella will, de will uh, develop DIC that is fatal, often before antiviral therapy can be started.